have you been dealing with evil? Narcissists can t tilt the scale on the evil level that they can be. Every day I hear the stories and there's no question in my mind that they are dealing with evil. But why are so many victims not believed when they present themselves with these crazy stories? Why is it that the burden of proof that, that they are evil goes on to the victim and, and re-injures the victim because they aren't believed? My name is Tracy Malone and I am the founder of NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. I'm a NARC educator and a coach. And if you're watching me on YouTube, you can also watch and listen to my podcast all over wherever you get podcasts. Today, I am honored to speak with Sherry Heller. She's a therapist from New York City, and she has an article that she wrote for my website that is called The Collective Denial of Evil and its impact on the psychiatric treatment that victims get. So let's hear what she says about evil and you decide. Have you been dealing with evil? Let's look at this together. Let's welcome her. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, my pleasure, Tracy. It's great to be here. Um, I first came across your article, The Collective Denial of Evil and Its Impact on the Psychiatric Treatment. Um, and when I read it, literally the blood like flowed out of my body. It, it just came so close to home that, that like, it, it horrified me. It was like in Harry Potter where, <laughs> you know, the Dementors come and suck the soul out. That was me. I was like sitting there and I'm like, oh my God, it is, there is evil out there. And, and we are in such a, a, a denial about this. Um, yeah. So when victims are, you know, met with this sort of evil, how does it manifest in a, uh, a therapy way. What mistakes have you seen where they've come to you and mm -hmm. gone to a therapist that doesn't really understand that there is evil out there? Yeah. Well, you know, evil is always cloaked in virtue. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have very kind of mythic ideas of what evil should look like. Um, but when we talk about people who are on the malignant end of the spectrum, of narcissism, psychopaths, sociopaths. Um, they know how to maneuver, to create cognitive dissonance, to confuse, to baffle, to virtue signal, to seem beneficent, to seem generous. And because we're predisposed to want to believe the best in people, uh, and even uh, clinicians, which is really still astounding to me, want to believe that even the most um, heinous abuse can't possibly be calculated, can't possibly be deliberate, you know, that somehow there must be some goodness in this person. So often people who come in, they are prematurely encouraged to, you know, reconsider their perceptions before there is a full understanding of gaslighting, you know, and of the entire narrative of what happened. You know, because the narcissist always starts out very, seemingly very virtuous. They know how to read people because that's how they glean supply. And so they maneuver in a way where they become exactly what they believe you want from another, right? They, they fit a mold and that's how they pull you in. It's part of the seduction and the love bombing. And when they're ready to assert dom dominion, because narcissists need to be in control. That's when they start to play games. That's when they start to psychologically toy with their victim, with their target. And a lot of people who come into therapy, they're starting to question what's happening. And they find that they're not believed. They have what's called Cassandra syndrome. And Cassandra was a Greek goddess who was given the gift of prophecy by Apollo. Um, and when he tried to rape her and she resisted him, he punished her by giving her the gift of prophecy, but no one would ever believe it. No one would ever believe her truth. And she went mad. So often Cassandra syndrome is a psychological term referred to those who are victims of narcissistic abuse trauma. 
um, because they're typically not believed. <clears throat> so, I mean, my, my intention of writing that article was to really amplify, especially for clinicians, the how imperative, imperative it is that we begin to see evil in the human condition, that there are people who are malignant, who have, as Herbie Cleckley, the psychiatrist who coined the term psychopaths, said they have a neuropsychiatric defect, they have a different brain structure than the normal population, <clears throat> they don't have empathy. And in fact, they're driven to destroy. And there is nothing about that that is just kind of misguided. It's very deliberate. Mm -hmm. And it's very calculated. So, you know, we have to really align with these victims and, and know that they're in danger. Yes. Yeah. And, and I see a, a percentage. I, I know narcissism, you know, psychopath and, and, and sociopaths are on a spectrum. But what I find is a, a percentage that really <clears throat> reach this evil state um, this, this horrific, they're going to do everything they possibly can to weaken the, the target yeah. and, and to make them think they're crazy. And it, it's re repetition that is slowly driving them to madness, if you would. Not, not mm -hmm. true madness like, a, like a, a psychopath, but where they aren't believed, where they go to a therapist and the therapist is saying, oh, why don't we just try to get along? And, yeah. you know, to me, that just makes my entire skin crawl when they're directed to go back to their husbands and try to work things out because he can't really be as evil as you say. Mm -hmm. And for a therapist to be saying something like that, it is further damaging the victim. Yes. I, I wrote another article about why it's contraindicated to do couples therapy with a narcissist. And I wrote it on the heels of um, a woman I was treating who was uh, maintaining no contact from a man she was involved with who at one point beat her so badly she lived in a car for about two months. <clears throat> and she played recordings to me that were absolutely just chilling. You know, um, he was stalking her and yet she's married to him. Mm -hmm. She left treatment, she re- connected with him. They did work together. I say that euphemistically and um, they're in the public eye. <laughs> so I kind of see this very strange depiction of their relationship. And it's almost crazy making for me because then I wonder how, wait a second. <laughs> the information I had was so blatantly clear. <clears throat> this guy was an unrepentant abuser is someone who was just so, um, I knew in the public eye, he had this very charming persona, but it's, it does make you doubt your own perceptions because then you see this other version of reality and you have to ask yourself what's real, you know? And that's why it's so imperative that we begin to see beyond this kind of fictional narrative that we see to the truth. We see that you have to look at intention, not don't look at behavior. Mm -hmm. Really look what's behind it, you know, and to see into a person's spirit, to see what they're, what's the agenda here? <clears throat> you know, what are they really trying to get at? I mean, what the narcissist wants is complete control. They want to, and ultimately they do want to diminish the other because they're completely envious of the life that they want to usurp. Mm, yeah. So you have to see, I look at how deteriorated the person is. When I see a person's deterioration, rather than pathologize them, I have to ask myself, how did they become this way? You know, I hear that, you know, on the one hand, the narcissist can look so stable. I had a couple where the narcissist seemed so centered and <clears throat> the wife, was so frayed and frazzled and discombobulated, it didn't take too long to discern like, oh, of course, he's a covert narcissist. <laughs> he's not interested in doing any of the work. He hasn't read any of the books I've assigned. He doesn't show up for sessions. He, he is this kind of perennial innocent. That's also a huge facade. You know, just, I just didn't know. And, uh, you know, it's, 
And then, and then it became very evident what was happening and she left him. Of course, he broke up with her through email. He ended their marriage through email. And then when she said, good, you know, go fuck yourself, I'm leaving. And then he's, and he's like, how could you do this to me? And she became the perpetrator, but she had already gotten to a point where she understood what was happening. Um, but again, if she was working with a therapist who was not questioning, you know, some of these inconsistencies, some of the discrepancies, then the likelihood would be that she would be encouraged to try to somehow uh, compromise, you know, and make concessions that would be self-annihilating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the level of evil to which they will go to to destroy someone is... <clears throat> um, I heard, I read an article this morning, um, you know, Ireland has the coercive control laws now and effective this morning or when this article came out this morning, um, they have now put the first person in jail for coercive control. And wow. this person <clears throat> like harassed his victim, his ex-wife. 5,700 times death threats in 30 days. Is that the mark that it takes to get there? Right, That's right. How yeah. much do you have to do? I mean, do you actually have to go murder them before they're going to see this? Um, yep. There's a level well, that's blatant. I mean, see, and that's, yeah, because it has to become that blatant before it's seen as uh, destructive, yeah. you know, and most narcissists are kind of more stealth. They're, they seem to have more nuance, so they're not going to, I mean, this is someone who obviously was so overtly um, enraged and impulsive. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that, because he was losing control, and I'm sure when they were together, he probably operated in a much more stealth way, I would think, who knows? But yes, I mean, it is, there's, I just wrote an article about different, when rape doesn't look like rape, and there is something called rape by deception. And I think a lot of women who get involved with narcissists feel raped in the aftermath, because how could you consent to something when you don't know what's real? How could you consent to someone when you're being lied to? Right. You know, often um, narcissists will have double identities. They don't necessarily completely you don't know what their marital status is. They're usually somatic narcissists who are sex addicts, will be with a million other people. <laughs> you know, who would knowingly walk into that situation and accommodate that? So there are some states actually where rape by deception is, is a crime. <clears throat> but of course, you, how could you prosecute it? That's, that is, I have a friend who I'm on a committee for, um, it's the consent is her thing is is the, the legal definition of consent um if you don't know who the person really is or they've lied to you then how could you possibly consent and so she's been changing the laws so those states that have done oh. it she's actually in new york and she's been spurring right. that to to go on and and um to change it in every state because it it's going to set a, a baseline that can be judged against. Without that, we just have a word that um, is consent and there's no definition of it. So, um, you know, that's something we need to look at. Um, you know, when when victims, <clears throat> I want to talk about evil one more time and just, just kind of back to it, just to, to the, the explanation of it because, mm -hmm. you know, we've got such a spectrum here. Where does evil fall? Where is it? Is it the absence of good? Um, mm -hmm. What is it that, that it takes it from yeah. like a crappy, shitty person to <laughs> evil? <laughs> well, we all have the potential for evil, right? We have higher impulses. We could be altruistic. We can love. We could be generous. Um, but we also have lower impulses. We're greedy. You know, we want what we want. We uh, can be demanding, you know. So we all have the potential where we fall in the realm of evil is dependent really on our moral development um, and our sense of humanity and our ability to be empathic. So people who are narcissistic lack empathy. So there is an absence of goodness, right? There's an inability to really have a conscience, to care. In fact, 
often narcissists really feel most alive when they're sadistic, you know, when they get to harm another. So that's when we talk about evil when we're going into around the moral depravity, where there's no sense of right or wrong. There's no real gauge to determine what is um, not just what looks like what is uh, falls within the realm of morality, but what feels uh, amoral, right? Like when you or I, if we do something that we regret, it weighs on us. You know, we may need to, we're repentant, we may need to want to make amends to a person. That's not within the scope of reality for a narcissist. Mm -hmm. um, when they harm another, it is the trajectory to further harm, mm -hmm. right? It's, there's an agenda there. It's a, it's a strategy <clears throat> to further diminish, to tear the person down, to control them, um, whether they have to use a smear campaign or then they start having the flying monkeys, getting people to help enable, you know, to assassinate the person's character under the guise of being, of caring for them, you know, wanting the best for them. Meanwhile, what they're doing is backstabbing them, stigmatizing them, pathologizing them, and getting people on board. So, so what does someone do if they're encountering this evil? <clears throat> Well, you know, a lot of my clients say YouTube, your videos, <laughs> you know, um, save them, not therapists, which is really sad. Um, most people came to me because they had to do their own research. They go online, they look for books, they try to figure out what the hell is happening here. How did my world fall apart? Um, you know, pain is a great motivator. Usually people get to a point where they just feel they have to stop suffering. So they will either try to reach out and to my chagrin, often they reach out to therapists who are not able to help them adequately, who don't really see what's happening. They can't assess the terrain. Um, but usually, you know, it's that saying knowledge is power. When they begin to get knowledge, they read, you know, material on your website, they go to various books, The Wizard of Oz, Another Narcissist, Seven Deadly Sins, all these great books, Craig Malkin. <clears throat> um, something, you know, kicks in. They begin to come out of the fog a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes all they need to, on that trajectory. And that's when people start on that path. They can't stop. I mean, because suddenly, they're, they feel like they have a sense of reality again. Mm -hmm. And they become detectives in this yeah. journey, right? They're, they're just feverishly sopping up everything yeah. they can to learn, could this possibly be? And then they're sort yeah. of in denial. No, no, no. And then they go, oh, I see that in action. So once they learn the word gaslighting, yeah. then all of a sudden it gets done to them and that light bulb goes off. So yeah reading about that and learning about that has put them in a place to go, oh my gosh, that's what's happening right now. And, and yeah. it helps them gain strength. It helps them kind of get angry because I think anger yeah. projects them into getting some serious help. You yeah. know, they can see and go, this isn't fair and, and yeah. I want to get better. Now they have the words for it and the anger propels them. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go, help me what the hell is happening here yeah the anger is so critical i i work a lot with particularly with women in anger um but men too i mean men have i think more access to their anger it's more culturally sanctioned for men mm -hmm. i think to be in touch with their aggression but um i always say the foundation of anger you know that is the path to power and um to reclaim power you have to be able to get back into that instinctual place because your aggression is um, an indicator of your being, you're threatened, your life is being threatened, you're in danger. Um, and you can't, you know, the discrepancy between what you feel in your body physiologically and what's going on in terms of the brainwashing, that's, <clears throat> that's where so much of the work is, mm -hmm. you know, in dismantling the, the indoctrination, the brainwashing, to see the truth, to get to the truth. Yeah. 
you've been doing this for a while, yeah. you know, being a, a therapist. Um, do you see an increase in this sort of, um, I don't know, is it the people that are coming for help because they've got all these resources to read books and to find YouTubes? Um, or is it that, that our society is like completely off the rails? Because people ask me that all the time. You know, my Facebook group is getting a hundred people applying every single day. Yeah. And it's just like, you, we can't keep the revolving door any, any faster. It's, it's to me, I see it, you know, going up so fast. Yeah. Have you witnessed that sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it is because there's much more a wealth of information that's available to people. I mean, when Malkin came out with the term echoism, it kind of coincided, I believe around when uh, Dr. Judith Herman coined the term complex trauma. A lot of, there wasn't even a language for this really. Um, so now there's a wealth of information. We're also in an age of lunacy. A lot of people come in and they're very concerned about the political landscape, what's going on globally. Um, there's a lot of mixed messaging. There's a lot of confusion. <clears throat> and so that plays a role. Um, I certainly feel that there is more awareness, you know, um, and I see an increase in people coming in who not only um, suspect that something's off, they're able to name narcissistic abuse, mm -hmm. especially maternal narcissism. I'm getting a lot of that. And I just did the training that Dr. Carol McBride um, offers therapists. And so I'm getting a lot of people coming in who were daughters of mothers who are on the spectrum and that's really also very um, perplexing for people because of the way that we preserve the archetype of the mother as being kind of the, the bastion of love and nurturance and generosity. Um, and now there's, a, I believe, this documentary out by Daryl Hammond, who is from SNL, Saturday Night Live, who's a comedian, who uh, was just besieged by mental illness, addiction, um, in and out of mental hospitals until he finally encountered a psychiatrist who was able to name the source of his torment as being his mother, who was a maternal narcissist, wow. who tortured him throughout his childhood. Um, and he's stabilizing now. And he, so he did this documentary called Cracked. Um, I think that the heightened awareness has a lot to do with it. Um, and I think the political landscape too. I think that there's a lot of fear. People are coming in and talking much more about their fears of what's happening in the world more than ever. Um, and the endemic narcissism that we see, our leaders are rife with narcissism <clears throat> throughout the world. Um, and that's a whole other thing too about what you were saying, you had shared with me about a, a therapist and who has, views that differ from your, you and I, and um, Alice Miller, whose work I love, she talks a lot about serial killers and she writes a lot about Stalin and Hitler and Mao Zedong and she, her premise is that these psychopaths all had histories of child abuse. Now that may be, that may be true, you know, but I maintain that that is not cause and effect. You know, I have clients who have some of the most unbelievably brutal histories who are kind and caring human beings. Mm -hmm. So you can't just make a statement that a narcissist is a tormented, was tormented as a child. You know, we're dealing with, <clears throat> there is a neuropsychiatric defect. There is something different about the narcissist. And we have to own that. We have to really accept that um, you can't just attribute it to environment. No, it's because bigger than that. I had a narcissistic mother. You know, mm -hmm. I had as much trauma as some of the narcissistic people. Yeah. Um, I believe both my sisters went that direction um, as, a, as a defense mechanism to her actions. But I don't think that, that you know, here's a stamp, boom. Okay, yeah. you got childhood trauma, now we understand. But still freaking evil, right? They're still mm -hmm. bringing into hurt people, like with the intent to hurt. 
is is where we cross the line and right. you know you were talking about how the awareness and the education has just amplified yeah. and that's usually with the victims right it, would I have 200 books on all my shelves around here if, if I hadn't been abused and trying to figure it out and, and right. mythicize the whole thing? No. But if we're the ones doing the work, why aren't <clears throat> jumping into this wagon to go, you know, let me look at this thing. There's a lot of people coming in my office. Maybe I should research more. Um, and and uh, to be fair, there are a lot of great and wonderful people mm. like yourself out there that are doing good work. But you and I both know that we hear the stories yeah. of the ones who got away and from a therapist that was just not mm. quite there. My yeah. therapist that had seen me for four years through my divorce and then three years through my horrific boyfriend that had me arrested. Um, at the end, when I learned about it, he said they like to look in the mirror. And, and I was like, oh, wait a second. No. So yeah. seven years of therapy was yeah. in very many ways, while it certainly was good to have someone to talk to and vent to when Cray Cray happened, mm -hmm. I, I could have been on a path seven years ago learning about this that would have alleviated me from having the, the worst abusive relationship. Yeah. He led me into it by his, his naivety. Yeah. You know... Um, I think we scoff at human evil because it's overwhelming. And I mean, I know, like I was sharing with you, I went on vacation and I really, um, realized how much I have to get back into my meditation routine. When you have to deal with these stories as a trauma therapist, uh, I, I leave sometimes my office and I feel like I'm, I'm in a dissociated state. I have to get myself grounded. Um, I have to remind myself, okay, I'm safe. <laughs> you know, when I was in Sedona and I felt like I was going through the second spiritual detox, I was just like filled with um, anxiety that was pouring out of me. Like all the stories I hear of trauma, of rape, of psychological abuse, the concealment, <clears throat> the, um, the, the just, driven to addiction, driven to like just financial ruin. I mean, everything you could possibly imagine. And to carry that, you have to really be focused on self-care. You have to be willing to take that on. And I think a lot of therapists want to be helpers and really are very sincerely, you know, motivated to want to focus on healing and the idea of holding a space for that level of trauma, also dealing with the homicidal rage that comes up in victims once they really kind of break through any, any illusions they have. It, it requires a level of presence. I think that not all people want to take on. You know, you have to focus on your own self-care. You have to be in your own therapy. You have to examine your own history. Um, so, you know, it's very comprehensive, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's why I always tell people if I have to refer out, because I do get so many referrals right now, I say, you have to work with a trauma therapist. You must work with someone who understands this specific kind of trauma. And so I often, you know, will have to help them <clears throat> to find their way to someone. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I know what the inclination is. Yeah. You try to, let's assuage, let's make things seem better than they are. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not going to help. That's not gonna foster healing. No. I think later on, we, we, we find compassion to move forward or release. But I, I, I don't think a therapist that goes, oh, why don't you just go home and make nice nice? <clears throat> And I've heard it, you've heard it, it, it yeah. it's heart-wrenching. And as you were describing the therapist that um, isn't taking this sort of thing on, because it, it, it is, I have seen, you know, over the last few years, it took a lot of training for me to be able to yeah. listen to 30 people tell me stories and just, 
you know, how not to take that on. Yeah. So it is a challenge and, and it does take a lot of work. It reminded me of, have you ever been to a massage therapist that literally goes swoop, 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 <laughs> one down, one over, one over. It's like, it, it's a robot, right? It, it, it's not like, oh my God, you found the spot. Oh no, I have to go to one, two. Right, it's intuitive. Yeah. Exactly. So it becomes something where they, they have heard the stories they, they know how to help people. They know how to give them tools to help yeah. them help. And I think that is, is such a different animal than when you're dealing with um, a, a non-evil psychopath, narcissist, sociopath. Um, you know, the cluster Bs are, are inherently at their core um, doing a lot of damage to people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> A normal therapist is going to put them in the bucket of, oh, it's just another marriage. Let's yeah. figure oh, well, they're mentally ill, or why don't, why can't you foster compassion and you know, um, just focus on you know living your life? And it's not, it doesn't work like that because when you're a target, it's not a matter of having healthy detachment or erecting boundaries. Right. When someone is on a mission to destroy you, you can't just deflect. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, you want to help the person to look at, and I do work with complex trauma. So I work with people largely who come from families where there's narcissistic abuse and they have to look at how they were groomed to be supply. I was groomed to be supply in my family of origin. So to dismantle that, I really had to do tremendous work, extensive work. And it's very difficult because then you have to face, I don't have a self beyond being a narcissistic extension. Who am I? Mm -hmm. you know and having to cultivate a sense of self um i have a woman i'm working with now who um really talked about this in her session yesterday and it's it's extremely debilitating yeah. because it's an empty feeling inside when you never have a mirror mm -hmm. you know and in fact you've become the mirror you've become this tool you know for your parents yeah. so there's so much to reclaim so much and you know your work is helping so many people and um i'm going to suggest i'm i'll put the link down below for everybody um to, to go and download this this article from my website it's it's like nothing i've ever read before but it is something that we really need to look at we need to understand that there is evil out there and what you are dealing with could very well be evil people um, this is something that um, you're going to have to do the detective work and find the resources because they're out there and uh, denying that there's evil and, um, you know, there's a religious aspect that can come into this, right? Uh -huh. You know, turn the other cheek and, you know, la la la, forgive and forget and, and all of those pieces that come in and become another another barrier for people to recover you yeah. know especially if they're 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 religious and spiritual they don't want to believe there's evil it, right. it, well i'm an interfaith minister so i certainly have a spiritual life wow, <laughs> wow. right um and uh being spiritual I, I do not denounce darkness i think that's materialism spiritual materialism so i think it is important to think holistically yeah so tell us where people can find out more about you because um, you have a website and, and let's just hear how they can find more about you. Well, the best way to reach me is through my website. It's sherrytherapist.com and I spell my name S-H-E-R-I and therapist, it's one word. And I have a private practice in New York City. And basically everything is linked on my site. I have a lot of articles that I've, uh, that I've written that have been published. Um, many that are inclusive of narcissistic abuse syndrome. So I'm gonna deviate from that, talk about other forms of mental illness um, and other issues. But I think um, that's the best way to reach me. Okay, well, we'll put the link down below. Right. And thank you so much for joining me today. This has been an amazing um, journey to learn about, dig more into, and um, I'm gonna use this resource to ship out to as many of my people so that they don't feel so alone. When oh, they realize that there's something bigger than what you think is going on here, it does give them just that little bit of peace and comfort to know I was dealing with evil. Oh my. 
<laughs> so thank you so much for being here today. And Tracy, my pleasure. Wasn't she great? I love that woman. She is so smart, so talented, and um, she does really great work. Understanding that evil exists may help you put the pieces of this all together. So I'm going to put a link to her article. It's about four pages long. It's a great article. It's going to help you see. She's got lots of um, citations and, and quotes from other books and authors that have set the stage for this um, for years and years. This is not a new concept. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, there'll be a link down below. Visit my website. If you're struggling with narcissistic abuse, you can read Sherry's article and check out all of the information that I have for you and find out how to work with her or I going forward. We believe you and we know that evil exists. This is Trace Malone. Thank you for listening and don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you again next time. Thank you.